Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. Um, the first portfolio is COVID-19 recovery and parliamentary business. Any members? I don't... I'll try it again. Is that any better? An inauspicious start to the afternoon. There we go. Third time lucky. For those not aware, the first item of business uh, this afternoon is portfolio questions. The first portfolio is COVID-19 uh, recovery and parliamentary business. As ever, any member wish wishing to ask a supplementary question should press the request to speak button or place an RTS in the chat function if they are joining us remotely. Um, we are tight for time across this afternoon, so as ever, I would appreciate succinct questions and succinct answers wherever possible. And I call uh, question number one, Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it will evaluate the progress made in achieving the intended outcomes of its COVID recovery strategy. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the COVID recovery strategy sets out three high level outcomes that focus on reducing inequalities and supporting people most affected during the pandemic. These outcomes that are shared with local government are also relevant to the Scottish Government's ongoing response to the cost crisis. The Scottish Government is working in close partnership with local government, Public Health Scotland, and the Improvement Service to promote these shared outcomes and consider the experience of different people and places across Scotland. Together, we are using a range of data sources, including national performance framework indicators, to better understand and evaluate progress towards our shared outcomes. Daniel Johnson. So, on that point, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, we all know that COVID continues to have an impact on things like poverty, diagnostic waiting times, and pupil attainment. So, can I ask how those things are being measured? And he alluded to the national performance framework. But I also know that colleagues in the Parliament have struggled to table questions relating to those sorts of measures. So, can I just clarify whether he believes that tracking those sorts of measures and reporting on them are part of the COVID recovery brief? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I would certainly judge that to be the case, yes. Uh, I think the issues that Mr Johnson raises are all relevant issues to the post-COVID situation. Um, the recovery measures that we are taking are not just COVID related because they are addressing the issue of inequality, for example, that Mr Johnson raises. He's heard me before saying that COVID simply exacerbated inequality, didn't simply create it for the first time. So I think the framework we have in place through the National Performance Framework effectively uh, does, uh, provides the forum to uh, address the issues that Mr Johnson properly raises. And, and just for the record, I would be very happy to answer any questions on these matters, should they be selected. Question number two, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government how its COVID recovery strategy is supporting rural and, uh, rural and island tourism businesses. Government Secretary. President, the Government is committed to supporting the recovery of the tourism sector in our rural and island communities. Since the pandemic started, we have delivered packages totalling £258.5 million to support Scottish tourism and hospitality businesses. We have established the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund to support critical projects in rural and island areas. Additionally, we have helped businesses recover with the Tourism Recovery Programme, consisting of 10 projects aimed at assisting and accelerating recovery, providing the foundations for the sustainable recovery of the sector. The new Tourism and Hospitality Industry Leadership Group we have established will drive sustainable long-term recovery. Alistair Allen. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. I have been contacted by a number of his hospitality businesses in my constituency who are concerned that they may not survive this winter due to the impact of the cost of living crisis, uh, with produce costs and energy bills both having skyrocketed. Given the devastating impact of uh, this and earlier events on the hospitality sector, can the Cabinet Secretary outline what representations the Scottish Government is making to the UK Government on the lack of adequate support uh, for energy costs for SMEs who are not on the gas grid? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, these are issues that are being uh, put to the United Kingdom Government on a regular basis by the Scottish Government, and indeed the First Minister indicated these points in her letter to the new Prime Minister on the 27th of October. The points that Dr Allen raises about the particular challenges of energy costs for non-grid uh, uh, users um, is a particular problem which is the subject of active dialogue with the United Kingdom Government and I assure him of the importance of that being taken forward or the Government recognises the importance of taking that forward. I would also make the point that the wider inflationary pressures 
uh, beyond energy costs in relation to food and supplies, to which Dr Allen has referred, are real significant issues, and they have been exacerbated by the decisions that have been taken that have fuelled inflation. And the lack of action on energy costs over the summer has contributed significantly to that experience as well. Question number three, Eleanor Whitham. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how it is working with colleagues in local government as part of its COVID recovery strategy to support Carrick, Cumnock and Doon Valley's recovery from COVID-19. Cabinet Secretary. President, President Officer, the Scottish Government and COSLA have agreed shared priorities for recovery, focusing on those most affected by the pandemic. The COVID recovery strategy brings together over 70 actions that will support people across Scotland by increasing the financial security for low-income households, enhancing the well-being of children and young people, and creating good green jobs and fair work. The strategy also focuses on renewing public services to ensure they meet the specific needs of people and communities. East Ayrshire and South Ayrshire councils that cover the uh, parliamentary constituency of uh, my colleague Elena Whitham in Carrick, Cumnock and Doon Valley have been allocated an additional £38.6 million and £34.4 million respectively to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic through the local government settlement. These payments are over and above their regular grant payments, which in 2022-23 have each increased by over 10 per cent. Eleanor Whitham. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can I ask what impact will the delay to the UK Government's fiscal statement have on the Scottish Government's ability to plan ahead in terms of the support which it can provide to local government, particularly in the context of the Tory Government's trashing of the UK economy and now making people pay the price for its failure with a new wave of impending austerity cuts, slashing public services and cutting incomes? And does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that independence is the only way to keep Scotland safe from the damaging Cabinet Tory Secretary. cuts and long-term economic decline? Yeah, yeah. So, sir, I, I fundamentally agree with the analysis applied by Elena Whittam. I, I would make the point that the decisions that were taken in the mini budget over the summer, and I have more to say about this in the statement I make to Parliament this afternoon, has significantly exacerbated the scale of the financial challenge that we, households and businesses, are wrestling with, and this will be felt acutely within the communities that Elena Whittam represents. Um, the uh, decisions and the timing of the fiscal statement being delayed from the 31st of October to the 17th of November compresses the available time that there is for the Scottish Government to consider uh, that information uh, and, as a consequence, to then formulate the uh, financial settlement for local government that arises. But I assure Elena Whitam that we will take forward the uh, dialogue she would expect of us with local government uh, in addressing these issues. Question number four, Jamie Green. Thank you, President. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its engagement with stakeholders regarding its COVID recovery strategy. Cabinet Secretary. President, Officer, the COVID recovery strategy was informed by extensive stakeholder engagement, and the Scottish Government continues to work closely with a wide range of partners to ensure we deliver a successful recovery. We meet regularly with stakeholders, including local government, community planning partners, the third sector and business organisations to resolve barriers, identify solutions and maintain progress. Our stakeholder engagement informs the discussions and decisions of the COVID Recovery Programme Board, which I co-chair alongside the COSLA President, and allows us to work together towards a shared national vision for recovery, as well as to support local recovery that is informed by local priorities. Jamie Green. I uh, am pleased that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned the third sector. I think we all appreciate the value of charities and volunteers during the COVID pandemic. I think it completely revolutionised the perception of selfless giving and helping our fellow communities. But that being said, in the pre-budget submission, Volunteer Scotland raised substantial concerns about what is likely to be inevitable cuts to third sector funding over the next couple of years, notwithstanding the issues mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary. How do we ensure that these much-needed vital volunteer organisations both survive but actually thrive in our communities, given the good work that they do and the pressure they take off paid public services? Cabinet Secretary. Mr Green raises a very substantial point, and it is one that um, I am very keen as we work our way through what is going to be a really difficult budget process this year, which will be compressed into a very short timescale, in which we – and I won't rehearse all of the uh, issues around about that. I'll have enough to say about that later on. But the point that Mr Green raises is one I am anxious at all times not to lose sight of, because I am convinced – and indeed I am a strong advocate of this within government – that there is work that the third sector can undertake 
which will deliver better outcomes, more than likely for less money, if we can properly support and de de deliver or design that assistance. Um, this morning I visited with Mr Gray, the Minister who is looking after the Ukrainian refugee programme, a third sector venture in Aberfeldy in my own constituency, where local volunteers emerging out of the uh, a COVID programme, a, a, a grouping called Feldy Roo, um, I will leave members to reflect on the name, um, but which delivered a vital assistance to families during the COVID pandemic. They have created a hub for welcoming and supporting Ukrainian refugees. They are now supporting over 70 individuals within the community, and it is working fabulously well. But it is a third sector venture achieving much, for, in huge amounts of very small amounts of money. So the point that Mr Green makes is one that I am very anxious we try to take forward substantively during the budget process. Supplementary, Jackie Bailey. Um, the decision to close all bar four of Scottish Enterprises' offices, including one in Clyde Bank, suggests that regional economic development is not a strategic priority for the Scottish Government, and there are real and genuine concerns that there is a disjointed approach to business support and to economic recovery. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how he will ensure that regional economic development and support for business is not lost as a result of these decisions? Cabinet Secretary. Let, let me just reassure Jackie Bailey that I, I do not consider that the, the, uh, the test or the measure by which we deliver effective business support is through the arrangements for offices around the country. There are many changes in the way in which services are now being delivered with an increasing move towards digital uh, uh, delivery of services and uh, the remote working with which we have all become familiar. And if that is a means of if the decisions that have been taken are means of enabling us to deliver wider ranges of business support, then I think we should be prepared to embrace reform. Because I simply say to colleagues, and I have much more to say about this this afternoon, the existing financial arrangements are going to put enormous strain on maintaining the current network of arrangements that we have in place. Can I finally, Presiding Officer, make clear to Jackie Bailey that the National Strategy for Economic Transformation recognises the absolute centrality of regional economic policy. And I welcome the opportunity to put that on the record today and to reassure Jackie Bailey about that point, because there is no point in the government pursuing an economic strategy that only works for some parts of the country. It needs to work for all parts of the country, and that is what is the focus of the regional economic policy approach of the national strategy. Question number five, Douglas Lumsden. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what support is available in the context of its COVID recovery strategy to help high streets recover from the pandemic and ensure that there are no long-term scarring effects. Cabinet Secretary. Um, so we are working with all of Scotland's cities and towns to support their recovery and help build thriving, sustainable towns and cities of the future. We maintain a competitive non-domestic rates regime, delivering the lowest non-domestic rates poundage in the UK for the fourth year in a row and supporting a generous package of non-domestic rates reliefs worth £801 million. This is in addition to the action we are taking to support our town and city centres and help retailers and communities recover not least through our £80 million COVID Economic Recovery Fund, the £6 million City Centre Recovery Fund, the £325 million Place-Based Investment Programme, our Retail Strategy and the Town Centre Action Plan. Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Retail Consortium reported last week that the recovery in vacancy rates has stalled in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK. And this is evident in my home city of Aberdeen, where the Business Improvement District Aberdeen Inspired have organised an emergency summit for next Wednesday to save Union Street. Will the Cabinet Secretary attend this summit so he can hear firsthand from the retail and hospitality industries the issues that they face? Cabinet Secretary. I, I think it is unlikely I will be able to attend that uh, event, although I am very glad that it is happening and that the business community is drawing together partners to ensure it can happen. If Mr Lumsden wishes to write to me after the event to let me know the, um, the issues that are raised and the points that are identified, I will happily engage on those questions. Um, I think it is important that individual communities, in the case of the City of Aberdeen, uh, join together the work of local authorities, business improvement districts. And um, I, I had a discussion just the other um, week there with um, Opportunity North East to identify further steps that we can take to advance 
um, much of the collaboration, the good collaboration that's going on on these measures. But I'll be very happy to address any questions that arise out of the summit if Mr Lumsden would draw them to my attention. And supplementary Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. In addition to the challenges posed by the pandemic and Brexit, businesses in Scottish high streets now face additional pressures caused by the catastrophic economic policies of the Tory Government at Westminster. With nothing but uncertainty and austerity cuts on the horizon as a consequence, would the DFM share my view that the people of Scotland have the right to decide whether to continue suffering under a less productive and highly unequal EUK economy or seize the opportunities that independence gives us? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I would very much welcome the opportunity for people in Scotland to have the chance to decide on the independence question and to be able to exercise the choice about the approach to governance that they wish to see in Scotland. We face extremely difficult challenges ahead, which have been made worse by a combination of Brexit and the United Kingdom Government's decision-making, which has had catastrophic implications for businesses and for families. So the point that Mr Kidd puts to me is a substantial point that, uh, with which I agree, and I would welcome the opportunity for people in Scotland to be able to exercise that choice. Question number six uh, has not been lodged. Question number seven, Stephen Kerr. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions ministers have had with the UK Government regarding making MSPs prescribed persons under the Public Interest Disclosure Act 1998 and extending parliamentary privilege. Minister Richard Lockhead. The Scottish Government has no formal role over MSPs of the Scottish Parliament, and the Scottish Parliament corporate body therefore led in making a direct request to UK officials on this issue. And the UK Government laid the statutory instrument that adds MSPs to the list of whistleblowing prescribed persons in Westminster on the 17th of October. When this change comes into force on the 15th of December, MSPs will have parity with MPs on this matter, and the Scottish Parliament will be responsible for providing MSPs with guidance and training on the impact of this legislation. Stephen Kerr. So I welcome the response from the Minister in relation to PEDA, uh, an act which I think is long overdue for reform. But every one of us in this chamber will hear from our constituents on a regular basis stories of injustice, people being let, uh, let down very badly by, by service providers, and, and of mistreatment and worse. And the Scottish Parliament must be the place where these issues can be brought up, discussed and addressed. And members of this Parliament uh, should be unafraid of censure or legal challenge. In fact, members of Parliament in the House of Commons are given legal protections when speaking in the House of Commons. So will the Minister support uh, a move to introduce the same privileges to members of the Scottish Parliament that are enjoyed by members of Parliament in the House of Commons? Minister. Whilst I think uh, Stephen Kerr makes a number of important points, uh, the Scottish Parliament, as opposed to the Scottish Government, has now taken action which will at least uh, improve the situation from the perspective of Stephen Kerr and indeed other MSPs in this chamber to give parity with MPs. And in this case of uh, whistleblowing, it means that anyone who wishes to approach an MSP can do so with their own employment being protected in the way that is the case with MPs in Westminster. Any other uh, improvements the member wishes to see, he may wish to raise with the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament if it is in relation to the privileges or otherwise of MSPs in this chamber. And question number eight, Stuart McMillan. Thanks very much to ask the Scottish Government what role the autumn winter COVID-19 booster vaccination programme will play in its COVID recovery strategy. Cabinet Secretary. So, so the winter vaccination programme will play a vital role in protecting people with the highest risk from severe illness and hospitalisation this winter. This will help ease the potential additional pressures the COVID-19 and, and flu will have on the National Health Service and social care services over the winter months. Though uptake of the vaccines has exceeded our expectations, we are continuing exploring ways to increase the vaccination rate. In line with our commitments in the COVID recovery strategy, we have embedded inclusivity as a key aspect of the vaccination programme from its outset, working alongside health boards and other partners to encourage uptake, remove barriers and respond to evidence of low uptake in certain communities, um, including those from more deprived areas. Um, the winter vaccination programme began on 5 September starting with frontline health and social care workers and residents and staff of care homes for older adults. 
Appointments for those aged 65 and over began on the 19th of September, and since 24th of October, those aged 50 to 64, with no additional risk factors, have been able to book an appointment online. Appointments for those aged 5 to 64 in a clinical risk group also began in the week commencing 24th October. Stuart McMillan. Thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it is vital that as many people as possible take up their offer of both COVID and flu vaccinations as is one way that we can help protect ourselves, our family, the wider community and take pressure off the frontline health services? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, Presiding Officer. I, I think the COVID vaccination programme has been an unbridled success. Um, it has uh, given such assurance to the population and it has also given us such protection of our vital public services that would have been overwhelmed had we not had the protection of the vaccination programme. It has also enabled um, many of us, but not all of us, because some of our fellow citizens still um, face real challenges because of their own and wider health factors in being able to return to something closer to normality in our lives. And that is a welcome uh, progress that has been del delivered by the vaccination programme. But I take this opportunity to encourage anybody in the eligible groups to take up the vaccination programme. Thank you. And supplementary, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would echo everything the Deputy First Minister has said about the importance of taking up the booster vaccination. I have booked my own for uh, next week. Perhaps I, will, perhaps I will see him there, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. But there does seem to be some uh, anecdotal evidence that individuals are, in some cases, reluctant to come forward for a booster at this stage, perhaps because they think COVID is over. Does the Scottish Government have any data as yet on the take-up figures for the booster, or when are we likely to get that data? And what more can the Scottish Government do specifically to target those groups, for example, from certain ethnic minorities who have a historic issue with reluctance to come forward and be vaccinated? Cabinet Secretary. The, uh, I am glad to hear that Mr Fraser has booked his appointment. So have I. Uh, I was going to be um, uh, rather impertinent and suggest that I would have thought he would have been in an earlier grouping to me age-wise. But, uh, <laughs> But, uh, but, but clearly, but clearly, but clearly, clearly, that would be inappropriate for me to even infer it, President. So, um, the the take-up has been very encouraging, and the and has actually um, exceeded our expectations to date. So, if uh, I, I'm, I'm not. Well, I have these numbers in front of me, so I presume I can use them. So, um, in, in older adults in care homes, for example, 85% have uh, uptake has been delivered. In the age 65 and over uh, age group, 74.2 per cent already, so, and we are not entirely through the programme. So we are um, very encouraged by the progress that has been made so far. Having said that, Mr Fraser's point is a legitimate one, that we have to use every opportunity to encourage people to take up the vaccination, to not be deterred by some of the stuff that swirls around, because this is essential protection for individuals, and it is also protection for our public services to try to reduce the demand that may well present itself. So uh, I, I, we are encouraged so far about the, um, the, the progress, but I assure Mr Fraser and Parliament that the government is tailoring its messages to make sure we reach the groups, as I said in my answer to Mr Macmillan earlier on, that we recognise we have got evidence from the previous experience where the, the take-up can be low and we are taking steps in our communication message to enable that to be uh, improved. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I can confirm that I booked my appointment as well, but can only assume that it is because NHS Orkney are working through the age groups more quickly than other health boards. With that, um, that concludes portfolio questions. On <laughs> <laughs> Point of order, Stephen Kerr. Deputy uh, Fred, no, sir, I, I, I had uh, failed in asking my question to disclose and to uh, point uh, members to my register of interests as a director of Whistleblowers UK, and I think it's important I put that on the record. Thank you, Mr Kerr. That is indeed uh, on the record. We now uh, move to the next portfolio of questions. The portfolio is finance and the economy. Again, I would encourage members who wish to ask a question um, to uh, press the request to speak button or place an RTS in the chat function if they're joining us remotely during the relevant question. Uh, question number one comes from Stephanie Callaghan, who joins us remotely. Ms Callaghan. 
Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its latest engagement has been with the UK Government regarding the funding available to support people with increased cost of living. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, I had an initial meeting with the new Chief Secretary to the Treasury last week and have sent a number of letters to the UK Government requesting urgent action to address the cost of living crisis, given the powers to properly support people and businesses are currently reserved. The First Minister also wrote to the Prime Minister last week calling for urgent action that meets the scale of the challenge, including additional funding for devolved governments to support our people, provide fair public sector pay uplifts and protect our public services. Stephanie Callaghan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Households and low incomes desperately need stability and certainty as they try to afford the essentials, pay their rent and keep food on the table. The Scottish Government call upon the UK Government to extend its cost of living support with new support packages that target those households most impacted by the increased cost of living, as we've done here in Scotland, and demand the uprating of benefits in line with inflation. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, th th these are calls that we have made to the United Kingdom Government. Um, we recognise the importance of increasing Social Security benefits in line with inflation in April. Um, and if we were able, to, for example, to see the bringing in of a permanent £25 uh, uplift to universal credit, that would make a huge difference to the circumstances of low-income households. The Government in Scotland, of course, is taking steps in the uh, public sector pay deals that we are putting in place to ensure that those at the lowest incomes receive the highest increases, uh, or the highest percentage increases, I should say. And these are all measures designed to try to support people practically. But I assure Stephanie Callaghan that the Scottish Government is using every opportunity to engage with our United Kingdom Government counterparts to advance these important issues. Question number two, Emma Roddick. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made regarding increasing the employment rate for disabled people. Minister Richard Lockhead. The latest figures from the Office of National Statistics Annual Population Survey show that the employment rate for disabled people in 2021 is estimated to be 49.6%. That is an increase from 42.8% in 2016, which was our baseline year for having the disability employment gap and indicates that we have made significant progress towards meeting our first interim targets to increase the employment rate of disabled people to 50 per cent by 2023. Emma Roddick. Uh, the progress that the Minister outlined is, is very welcome. Um, can he confirm that the Scottish Government is on track to meet its overall targets in increasing the employment rate? Minister. Uh, Thank you. In the Scottish Government's 2018 publication, A Fairer Scotland for Disabled People Employment Action Plan, we identified interim milestones that the employment rate for disabled people will increase to 50% by 2023, as I said, but also 60% by 2030. So I can confirm that it is our understanding that we are currently on track to meet these targets. And the Scottish Government also made an overarching commitment to ensuring that the disability employment gap is reduced by at least half from its 2016 level uh, by 2038, uh, as the member said. So uh, I think we are making good pro progress in Scotland, but of course there is still a lot to do. And supplementary, Jeremy Balfour. Um, can the Minister shed a little light on why Scotland lags behind England in terms of disability employment? The latest figures I have from 2021 show that the average English employment gap is 27 per cent, as low as 22.4 per cent in the south east of England whereas the gap in Scotland is 32.8 per cent. Why the difference? Minister. Well, can I say to the member I am happy to look at the regional figures for, for England and try and delve in a bit further to why there may be any differential, but I think it is encouraging that we are making progress in Scotland with closing the disability employment gap, and the measures we are taking are hopefully making a, a difference, but of course there are many stakeholders and organisations who are supporting that uh, as well. Uh, there are a number of different indicators. Uh, some Scotland are ahead of the rest of the UK, and the members highlighted some uh, regional disparity, perhaps, in, in terms of this debate. So I'd be happy to look into this further uh, and perhaps drop a note to the member. Question number three, Finlay Carson. Uh, to Scot ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide details of the £53 million reduction in the employability budget announced by the Deputy First Minister in September 2022. Minister Richard Lockhead. 
The £53 million referenced was to support additional employability activity in 2022-23. So the decision not to issue this funding, of course, was not taken lightly, but at a time of acute labour shortages, historically low unemployment and soaring inflation. And Scottish ministers have been clear on the need to prioritise money in people's pockets now over additional spending on employability, which is unlikely to result in immediate benefits for individuals. We have, however, maintained our existing investment in employability this year, with over £59 million being made available through the No One Left Behind approach and £23.5 million available through Fair Start Scotland in 2022-23 as well. Finley Carson. I thank the Minister for the response, but any cuts to the employability budget uh, could impact on essential apprenticeship places uh, right across Scotland. There, there are presently almost 1,000 apprenticeships in Dumfries and Galloway with uh, employers such as Jazz P. Wilson and DuPont Films. These apprentice places provide an excellent pathway for young people to develop their skills and give them a great start in their career, but also uh, create uh, skills that are vitally needed in my constituency. Will the Minister uh, give a commitment to protecting uh, these apprenticeships so that young people in my constituency and across Scotland will continue to have these opportunities? Minister. Uh, yes, I am happy to give the member the assurance uh, that he asks for, but I would point out, of course, that the employability budget is a different budget and is under our limited powers in relation to employment, where we can support people who are very far from the labour market to come into the labour market, and that is uh, what we are speaking about in terms of the employability budgets. I would also make the uh, obvious point to the member that if he is concerned about the budgets available to the Scottish Government, and indeed this Parliament, he should be making representations to the UK Government and he perhaps may wish to offer his support to the Deputy First Minister when he delivers his budget statement in a short while. And brief supplementary, Daniel Johnson. Uh, the notable thing about the employability cut is it was the only line within uh, tra skills and training that was actually going up in the last budget. But it does underline the, the need to focus on this area. So what is being done to improve uh, apprenticeships and other uh, skills measures to maintain or improve their accessibility to disabled people? Minister. Uh, can I just reiterate to the member uh, that we still retain our employability budget and what was cut was the planned increase. Uh, so we clearly took that decision against a very difficult backdrop. And in terms of his reference to apprenticeships, I think I answered the point to the previous member about that, and also disabled people uh, in terms of the previous question uh, uh, as well. So this specific question is about employability budgets. We still have the employability budget, but the substantial increase we had planned for him, uh, of course, was cancelled due to the pressures on Scotland's overall budget. And question number four, Siobhan Bray. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government if it can provide an update on Presswick Airport and the contribution to the South Asia economy. Minister Tom Arthur. Presswick Airport continues to grow steadily, making a positive contribution to the local and regional economy, supporting 300 direct jobs and many more in the local economy. The airport is working with the councils to play its part to attract inward investment with projects that are connected with aviation. The management and board have a clear strategy to deliver growth and the airport continues to strengthen its position as a niche airport with a reputation for being innovative and flexible in meeting customers' needs. Siobhan Brown. I thank the Minister for that answer. Presswick was one of the few airports in the world to make a profit during the pandemic and also played a major part in cargo distribution across the whole of the UK. With the Brexit chaos and the backlog cargo at Heathrow, it was actually quicker to send cargo to Presswick and then down to London um, than it was to get it out of Heathrow. Presswick Airport is also an integral part of the aerospace industry, which currently supports over 4,000 jobs locally. Does the Minister agree with me that the continual Conservative criticism in the Chamber of, bizarre, of Presswick Airport is bizarre? Minister. Um, I, I would agree with the member that it is very important uh, for all of us um, uh, to consider the language we use in this chamber and to make sure that when we are seeking to make critical points, we do not do so in a way that talks down or undermines confidence in any sector of our economy. Now, Presswick clearly has had significant challenges, but the recent performance of the business is promising and welcome. Significant progress has been made in winning a bigger share of the fixed-based operations market. Property around the campus has very high occupancy rates. And as well as continuing its passenger operations, it is focused on growing its dedicated cargo operations, for which it has a strong reputation. 
and is home to approximately half of Scotland's aerospace sector, Prestwick is playing a key role in the Ayrshire growth deal and helping to unlock significant inward investment, creating high-value jobs and potential supply chain opportunities in South Ayrshire too. That is progress we can all surely be proud of, including all of the opposition parties. Thank you. And apologies, I should have advised earlier on that there is a grouping in this portfolio uh, section. Group uh, 5 and 8 are grouped, so any supplementaries I will have to take after uh, question 8. And I call question 5, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent engagement it has had with the UK Government on matters impacting the Scottish economy. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, over the course of the last few weeks, I have uh, had discussions with the, well, a number of Chief Secretaries to the Treasury, but uh, the new one uh, just last week. And I have also had extensive discussions with the, uh, the Secretary of State for Levelling Up, or the one before the current uh, Secretary of State for Levelling Up, on the issue of investment zones. I have made clear the impact of the current economic crisis on people across Scotland and our economy, including the increased pressures on the Scottish budget and the vital public services that we support. Audrey Nicholl. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that response. Aberdeen in the North East has made significant contributions to UK government coffers through its energy sector. And in return, the north east of Scotland has been gifted Brexit, with Aberdeen the worst hit UK city at a cost of £9,000 per person, turmoil in the housing market and sky rise energy bills, damaging families and forcing small businesses to close. Does the Deputy First Minister agree with me that it is time that the UK Government stops treating the north east as a cash cow and that Rishi Sunak has to get a grip on the economy that his party has ruined. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, uh, Audrey Nicholl raises some very serious economic issues that are affecting the North East of Scotland. Uh, the principal one that she raised was about Brexit and the implications that is having on supply of labour and on the ability of companies to trade effectively with markets with which they were very familiar up until the implementation of the Brexit deal. That difficulty has been added to by turmoil in the housing market, where the housing market has been severely damaged by the effects of the mini-budget and the wider consequences that uh, Audrey Nicholl has highlighted. Now, so I, I think she, Audrey Nicholl raises very significant issues that are having a negative effect on the North East of Scotland economy. Now, obviously, the Scottish Government is keen to support the North East of Scotland through the matching funding that we have put in place to the Aberdeen City Region deal um, uh, uh, and also the money we have put in place for the Energy Transition Fund, £75 million. Pounds, um, and we have ov obviously committed to the £500 million pounds Just Transition Fund. So we recognise the significant challenges the North East of Scotland economy faces. A transition has got to be made to net zero. That has got to be done in a, a just fashion. And the Scottish Government is determined to work with the North East of Scotland and interested local authorities and parties eh, to advance that agenda. But the prevailing economic conditions are very challenging because of Brexit and the prevailing economic mood arising out of UK Government decisions. Question number eight, Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I have not, in fact, had a meeting with the uh, Chancellor, and, uh, but I have been in correspondence with the Chancellor um, on a number of occasions about issues, as was my predecessor, uh, Kate, well, well, Kate Forbes, the substantive uh, uh, Finance Secretary. I would point out that a number of these letters from Kate Forbes, the Welsh uh, Finance Minister and the Northern Ireland Finance Minister, were not replied to for significant numbers of months by UK chancellors. So when we get lectured in this place about the engagement with the United Kingdom government, I would point out that some of our correspondence quite simply does not get answered. And I've had an apology from the Chief Secretary to the Treasury for that fact, and I'm glad to say I replied to my most recent letter. So it is sometimes difficult for us to advance that dialogue um, when there is nobody at the other end engaging on these questions. Annabel Ewing. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer, and it is, of course, very disappointing to note that the latest UK Chancellor, by not finding the time 
to even speak with the Deputy First Minister and Acting Finance Director, uh, Cabinet Secretary, directly, uh, appears to have as little regard for Scotland and our elected government as his predecessors. Uh, and as for the lack of response to correspondence, there is absolutely no excuse for that. What on earth happened to the respect agenda? But can I ask the Deputy First Minister to advise as to what options, if any, will be open to him in the context of the devolved budget settlement to protect the people of Scotland from further UK Tory government austerity cuts, cuts that the people in my Cowdenbeath constituency and people across Scotland did not vote for. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, 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 Annabel Ewing puts her case powerfully, as I would expect, and uh, the constituents that Annabel Ewing represents in Cowdenbeath will be significantly affected in a negative way by a further programme of austerity. Annabel Ewing, in her caseload, will be dealing with the consequences of the last round of austerity from the United Kingdom Government. Um, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury has promised me um, dialogue in advance of the statement on the 17th of November. Uh, I obviously will commit myself to that at any occasion in the hope of influencing the agenda to avoid a further round of austerity because that would be very damaging for uh, Ms Ewing's constituents and for members of the public around the country. I would point out there was absolutely no interaction with the Scottish Government before the mini-budget in um, uh, earlier on, I, I'm just trying to think when it was, late September. Absolutely no dialogue. Indeed, not even the courtesy of an advance phone call, um, which is a breach in terms of the normal protocols of dialogue that are undertaken. So, the, the current Chief Secretary to the Treasury has assured me that there has been a restoration of the normal protocols of interaction. I will hold on to that because it is vital that the Scottish Government and the Welsh Government, and my, my colleagues in Wales and Northern Ireland are just as livid about this as I am, I might add, um, that we are properly engaged with to ensure that we can put forward the concerns and the views of members of Parliament and particularly constituents such as those of Ms Ewing that she has put to me today. A brief supplementary, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy for, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, uh, the Deputy First Minister has mentioned his engagement with the UK Government, but I was disappointed to learn recently there has been minimal engagement from Scottish Ministers on the development of the UK National Shipbuilding Strategy uh, and the refresh of that. Would the Deputy First Minister please commit to having the Scottish Government engaging fully with that strategy, given that we are the second biggest purchaser of vessels in the public sector outside the Ministry of Defence, and we need to get this right when those vessels are awarded to Turkey. It's a failure for Scottish industry. I'm, I'm very happy to commit to, um, to dialogue on any aspect of strategy that affects the industrial base of Scotland or any other question in Scotland. But I respectfully point out to Mr Sweeney there has not been a functioning United Kingdom government for the best part of 12 months. It literally has not functioned. Interaction has been appalling. Dialogue one way. There has been no decision-making coming back from the UK Government. And what decision-making they have undertaken, as Mr Sweeney and I will agree, in the mini-budget was catastrophic. So I hope we have got some degree of functioning government in the United Kingdom Government to allow us to advance the very legitimate issue that Mr Sweeney puts to me this afternoon. Question number six, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President no, Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing to businesses in the hospitality sector in light of the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and the cost of living crisis. Minister Tom Arthur. The hospitality sector is vital to Scotland's economy. We provided over £4.7 billion in support to businesses during the pandemic, including across the tourism and hospitality sector, and are closely monitoring impacts of the cost crisis. We are also establishing a tourism and hospitality industry leadership group to drive sustainable long-term recovery. We maintain competitive non-domestic rates, delivering the lowest non-domestic rates poundage in the UK for the fourth consecutive year, supporting a package of non-domestic rates reliefs worth £801 million. In light of increased pressures and limited powers, we will continue to press the UK Government for support. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that response. During the recent October recess, I was invited to meet with a number of pub owners from Coatbridge Main Street who expressed a real concern about the viability of their businesses in the short term. Due to the cost of living crisis, rising energy costs and changes in behaviour following the pandemic, 
One of these, the Eden Group, who employ nearly 100 people in my constituency, were also in the national newspaper this weekend. The Minister might have seen that. They are calling on the Chancellor to cut VAT immediately, offer rates assistance and provide some form of recovery funding. Would the Minister agree with these calls on the UK Government and lend his voice to them? Minister. Uh, presiding officer, we understand that businesses such as the Eden Group, operating in Fulton McGregor's constituency, continue to face significant challenges, including the longer-term impact of the pandemic and cost crisis. And we do not underestimate the scale of these challenges. That is why my colleague, the Deputy First Minister, wrote to Jeremy Hunt, the new Chancellor, on 19 October to re-emphasise the need for targeted support for households and businesses funded by windfall gains in the energy sector and seeking clarity on the support that will be available from April 2023. We will continue to work with businesses in Scotland to press the UK Government for a range of measures to help ease the current pressures, including on VAT and recovery support. Supplementary Douglas Lobsten. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Audit Scotland report um, called on Scotland's financial resp response to COVID this year stated that 100 per cent of the 4.5 billion of Barnet consequentials related to business support was allocated. But can the Minister tell me how much of the 4.5 million was allocated to funds but not spent? And is that money now available to help businesses who are struggling right now? Minister. Um, we have committed all COVID consequentials for business support that we received during the pandemic to support businesses. I missed some of the detail of the members' questions, but I will be happy to consult the official report and get back to them in writing if there was anything I missed in the points that he made. And question seven, Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing to small businesses through the cost of living crisis. Mr Richard Lockhead. We understand the challenges facing small businesses, which have been exacerbated by the economic upheaval caused by the UK Government in recent weeks. We have in place an existing package of non-domestic rates reliefs wor worth over £800 million, which includes the UK's most generous small business bonus scheme. However, the powers and resources required to tackle this crisis, of course, lie with the UK Government, and we will continue to press them to do everything possible to help Scotland's small businesses. Faisal Chowdhury. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, and I refer uh, members to my entry of the register of interest. Uh, I have already been contacted by uh, business owners within the Lothian region, particularly in the restaurant businesses, who have been operating for decades, but now find themselves having to close for good thanks to the perfect storm of COVID, a staffing crisis, and now the cost of living crisis too. As we see uh, this happening across multiple sectors at once, does the Scottish Government share my fear that we may have preserved our economy through the worst of the COVID pandemic, only to see it hollowed out by this latest crisis? Minister. I can assure Faisal Chowdhury that we absolutely share his fears and his concerns in relation to the impact of the current cost of living crisis and rising energy bills on Scotland's small businesses in Lothian and throughout the country. And I should say that uh, Faisal Chowdhury and myself and some others in the chamber were at the Asian Catering Awards dinner last night, where we enjoyed not only some fantastic curry and some good company, but we also heard from numerous small businesses in the hospitality sector and the catering sector, the restaurants, of the enormous challenges they are facing at the current time with rocketing energy bills, bills for ingredients eh, and other costs. And this is a very, very serious situation. And the First Minister, of course, wrote as recently as the 27th of October to the new Prime Minister, stressing the urgent need for clarity on what support will remain available for non-domestic consumers beyond April. And we have committed to working with the business sector to explore how businesses can be supported with their energy costs within our devolved powers. And we are supporting Business Energy Scotland and businesses should contact Business Energy Scotland for advice. And we will do everything else within our powers. Very brief supplementary bill, Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. Many small businesses in Scotland are facing substantial pressures, as has been said. So, can the Minister provide any update as to the Scottish Government's latest engagement with the UK Government regarding support available to small businesses to deal with this rising cost? As briefly as possible, Minister. Uh, I just reiterate to Bill Kerr to make many perfectly powerful points and valid points uh, that the First Minister, of course, has just written to the new Prime Minister about these issues, and we await a response and hopefully a positive reply. And I have no doubt that uh, the Deputy First Minister will address some of these issues in his forthcoming statement. 